Sir Hugo Swire. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker, and I'm extremely grateful to have secured this uh, adjournment debate on the topical and important issue of the current political situation uh, in the Maldives. On the 1st of February, the full bench of the Supreme Court in the Maldives ordered the retrial of cases against nine political prisoners, leaders, including former President Mohamed Nasheed, labelling their trials politically influenced. The Supreme Court also ruled that 12 opposition MPs, barred from Parliament by the Elections Commission, must be allowed to retake their seats, thus handing the opposition a majority in Parliament which has the power to impeach the President. The Maldives Police Service immediately announced it would comply with the Supreme Court ruling. Over the next two days, President Yamin fired the police chief, fired his replacement and installed a third police chief. On the 5th of February, President Yamin declared a 15-day state of emergency. Masked security officials broke through the doors of the Supreme Court and physically dragged the Chief Justice away uh, and threw him uh, in detention. Another Supreme Court Justice was also detained and thrown in jail. President Gayoum Yamin's half-brother was also detained. The remaining three Supreme Court judges then overruled the 1st of February judgment, despite it being unconstitutional for a three-bench court to overturn the decision of the full bench. On the 20th of February, President Yamin petitioned Parliament to extend the state of emergency by 30 days. However, the ruling party was unable to gain a quorum in Parliament. Just 40 MPs attended Parliament. Quorum demands 43. But President Yamin announced the state of emergency extension regardless. The Prosecutor General has publicly declared the state of emergency extension to be unconstitutional. But despite the state of emergency and a 10.30pm curfew in Mali, daily anti-government protests have spread across the Maldives and have now entered their fourth week. Riot police have severely beaten numerous protesters, hospitalising many. A total of 110 individuals have been arrested since the declaration of the state of emergency, and 31 of these are being held without trial under state of emergency rules. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are growing divisions in the security services. Some 50 military and police officials are being detained either at their barracks in Comunicado or in detention centres. Four members of Parliament are currently in detention. So why should any of this be of any interest to us here uh, in the United Kingdom? I'd like to make four points this evening. The first concerns radicalisation. President Yamin continues to collude with a network of radical Islamicists in the Maldives who are suspected of carrying out 26 murders over the past few years. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I suspect I know which angle he's coming in from. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I think you absolutely know exactly what angle I'm coming from. Uh, the, the, the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, congratulate him on getting this, this debate in the House. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman will be aware uh, of the religious persecution that there quite clearly is in all dives. I know some of my constituents have went there in holiday. Uh, one of them was imprisoned and sent back home because he took his Bible with him and he was able to read his Bible. It's against the law to, to, to read a Bible and be a Christian in the Maldives and to practice your religion. Does, is that not just another example of the human rights abuses carried out in Maldives, in this case against those of a religious and a Christian belief? Well, this is the great uh, dilemma of the Maldives. It is on the one hand an Islamic country, but on the other hand it is host to many hundreds of thousands of people on whom it depends from around the world who should be free to carry out uh, their own religion, even if they are on holiday. Uh, indeed, I give way to my honourable friend. Thank you very much for, for giving way. Uh, president uh, Mohamed Nasheed was the first democratically elected president of the Maldives. He was elected after years of having been uh, uh, tortured and abused in that country's jails by his predecessor. And he was a great leader, famously closing the political prisons, holding his first cabinet meeting underwater to highlight climate change. And he was a truly progressive, secular leader 
in a democratic country? Does he not share my tremendous sadness at just how far this country has fallen at the hands of utterly corrupt and malignant forces? Well, my uh, friend is, of course, absolutely right, and I shall go on to say something about this. I very much see uh, former President Mohammed Nasheed having a role in the future of the Maldives, along with others who sometimes have been his political uh, opponents, but he is absolutely right. Uh, a number uh, of, uh, uh, including there have been murders of prominent liberal bloggers and journalists as well. In late September last year, Her Majesty's Government warned that terrorists were very likely to carry out an attack on the islands. I understand that this is also the current travel advice from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, allegedly, there are between 200 and 250 Maldivians either fighting or who have fought in Syria and Iraq. US Assistant Secretary of State Alice Wells claimed that the Maldives was the highest foreign fighter contributor to the so-called Islamic State per capita. Much of the recruiting and radicalization is promoted by websites such as Bilad al-Sham and also Facebook and other social media is more accessible than ever on the remote islands that make up that country. This brings me, Mr Deputy Speaker, to my second point, which concerns the safety of our British tourists. The United Kingdom ranks third in the list of visitors to the Maldives in 2016, behind Germany and China, with 7.9% of market share. Uh, that's over 100,000 visitors. This actually was an increase of uh, some 9.8% compared to 2015. The Maldives' economy remains a tourism-driven economy which contributes more than 25% of the country's GDP. While the tourism sector supplies over 70% of the foreign exchange earnings to the country, one third of the government revenue is generated from this sector, one third of the government's revenue. Tourism is also known as the leading employment generator in the country. In 2016, tourism contributed 36.4% to the government revenue. But as a result of the current situation, the Maldives is facing financial ruin, with the tourism industry estimated to be losing as much as $20 million per day since the start of the state of emergency. If this trend continues, it will lead to unemployment and dissatisfaction, both, to my way of thinking, active recruiting sergeants for radicalisation. And with our tourists spread out over 115 square miles, in 105 resorts, it is almost impossible to guarantee their safety. My third point concerns the Commonwealth. After 30 years, as we've heard, uh, of President Mahmoud, Mahmoud Abdul Gayoom's rule, it was President Nasheed who introduced democracy into the Maldives. But since 1982, they were a welcome member of the Commonwealth family. It is President Yamin who took the country out of the Commonwealth in 2016. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Honourable Member for giving way and refer to my registered interests on Maldives. Uh, could I ask the Member if he is going to draw some attention to the fact that the United Kingdom, because Maldives has left the Commonwealth, that the United Kingdom's reach there has declined somewhat. And what can we do to rebuild that relationship, working with the Ambassador? that's based in Europe and working with the government to make sure that we can rebuild that relationship mm -hmm. for the very reasons that he has now outlined to make the country more prosperous but importantly to turn it away from what would be a terrible plight if his predictions were to come true. Two surrounding countries, uh, you know, both uh, Sri Lanka and India, are members of the Commonwealth and I'm going to say in a minute how I believe there's much needs to be done before they can come back into the Commonwealth, but their proper place is back within the Commonwealth family. Uh, President Yamin's unconstitutional behaviour has seen him arrest three lawmakers and instigate, instigate a witch hunt of the families of his political opponents, including wives and children. President Mamoun and the justices of the Supreme Court have been charged with treason and bribery, access to lawyers and family has been restricted with reports of ill treatment. With the arrest of President Gayoom, all the leaders of the opposition political parties are now under detention or have been sentenced under similar trumped-up charges. The government continues to defend its actions, stating that state of emergency powers are applicable only to those who are believed to have planned, 
or carried out illegal acts in conjunction with the 1st of February Supreme Court ruling. This has led to increasingly politicised target- targeting uh, of the opposition by the security services. President Gayoom's daughter, Dunya, resigned last week as a state health minister and has herself now appealed for support from the international community. I very much hope that she will work with former President Nasheed and other members of the opposition to come together to chart a democratic future for that country, a future hopefully back within the Commonwealth family. Am I right on my friend? I give way to my friend. Uh, my right honourable friend is making um, a very powerful case. Would he agree with me, though, that when you have a situation under the guise of a state of emergency where judges are arrested, the normal businesses of courts is suspended, members of parliament are arrested, parliament is suspended, this is actually making a mockery of any notion of democracy, and indeed more than that is an affront to human rights, and that members of this House on all sides should condemn that action in the strongest possible terms. My right honourable friend is absolutely right. There can be no pretense that democracy is alive uh, in the Maldives at the moment, unfortunately. The government also continues to condemn foreign criticism of its actions, will no doubt be now criticising my right honourable friend for his intervention, asking members of the international community not to chastise them publicly and to visit the Maldives to determine the situation for themselves on the ground. However, when a delegation of EU heads of missions did visit Mali, the government refused to meet them, and similarly a delegation from Law Asia were detained and deported upon their arrival at the airport in Mali on Tuesday, the 27th of February, despite their having informed relevant government authorities in ample time of their intention to visit. My fourth point, Mr Deputy Speaker, concerns the possibility of regional conflict. In recent years, China has been sending more tourists to the islands and investing in the economy. In neighbouring Sri Lanka, we see China building a port at Hambantota and a 11,500-foot runway capable of taking an Airbus A380 and docks where oil tankers can refuel. This has caused understandable nervousness in India, and it is difficult to believe that the Indians will allow the Chinese to gain a similar foothold in the Maldives. Additionally, it is reported that the Japanese Navy recently spotted a Maldivian registered tanker, which allegedly is linked to President Yamin's nephew, transferring suspected crude oil to a North Korean tanker in violation of UN sanctions on DPRK. It would be interesting to hear the Minister's response to this. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have seen the statement put out by the European External Action Service on the 6th of February, and I have seen the Foreign Secretary's statement the day before the 5th of February. But will Her Majesty's Government now go further, building on the calls made on the Government of the Maldives by the International Democrat Union on the the 21st of February, and call for the release and access to lawyers for all political prisoners? lobby for a UN-backed mission led by someone like Kofi Annan to go to the Maldives without delay. Call for free and properly convened elections later this year to be overseen by an international body. Provide support and assistance in the wholesale reform of judges and the judicial system. Work with other like-minded countries to counter Islamic radicalisation in the Maldives raise the issue of the Maldives at the forthcoming Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting here in London in April, and ask the opposition parties to provide a list of resorts owned by President Yamin's circle in order that they can be publicised and boycotted in the event of none of the above happening. And at the same time, Mr Deputy Speaker, put plans in place to increase targeted sanctions against the Yamin regime if the Supreme Court ruling is not fully implemented. Mr Deputy Speaker, as we exit the European Union, this is a good opportunity for the United Kingdom to show that we have our own foreign policy working with like-minded friends. 
Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, the member for East Devon, for securing this debate. Um, during his time as one of my predecessors in the office I currently hold, he was tireless in his efforts to improve uh, the political and human rights situation uh, for all of the people of the Maldives. Uh, so I pay great tribute to his continued com commitment to this cause, and I share his disappointment and, yes, it's his alarm at the recent deterioration in the political outlook in the Maldives. Whilst I cannot promise that I will uh, uh, deliver on every last bit of his shopping list uh, in his speech, please rest assured uh, uh, it uh, does provide uh, not just food for thought, but uh, I think an important uh, pointer for the future. And we will look uh, at each and every one of the uh, proposals that he has put forward. I'm also very grateful for the interest uh, and the shorter contributions of other honourable and right honourable members, and I shall try to respond to uh, a range of the points that have been raised during the course of this debate. Let me start, if I may, by setting out the current situation in the Maldives, which, uh, as I say, is deeply concerning, uh, and this Government's response before touching on the implications for visitors and the wider international context. Now, for several years, and indeed particularly since 2015, President Yamin has been cracking down on the rights of political opponents, judicial institutions and the independent media, all in a bid to strengthen his own grip on power, despite growing popular discontent at his rule. Over the past year, the leaders of all Maldivian opposition parties have spent time either in jail or in exile. In July, President Yamin used the military to enforce a shutdown of Parliament to prevent the opposition from voting to impeach the Speaker, who is a close confidant of his. Parliament has, in, in essence, been ineffective in the Maldives since that time. As my right hon. Friend pointed out, on the 1st of February this year, the Supreme Court of the Maldives ruled that Parliament should release nine prominent opposition leaders from prison and reinstate the 12 MPs who had been stripped of their seats when they sought to leave the President's party for the opposition. This included the former President Nasheed, who I know is well known uh, to several UK political figures, not least my honourable friend for Richmond Park. He currently resides here in the UK in exile. Um, his time in office was, to be honest, turbulent, but he did represent an era of significant steps forward towards a more open and democratic Maldives, a secular Maldives, a Maldives that would have uh, taken religious freedom seriously in the way that the Honourable Gentleman for Strangford uh, would wish all uh, to experience. However, just four days later, on the 5th of February, President Yamin declared a state of emergency in response to uh, the Supreme Court decision. Now, the effect of this is to suspend, amongst others, rights to privacy, freedom of assembly and silence uh, following arrest as well as protections from an unlawful arrest. These measures were extended on the 20th of February for a further 30 days. In the weeks since the emergency was declared, the Maldivian Parliament has been closed down. Two of the five Supreme Court judges, including the Chief Justice, have been arrested. More opposition leaders and their families have been jailed. Journalists and protesters have been pepper sprayed and arrested. Now, there are, of course, wider human rights concerns that still persist, and they include the government's highly regrettable and stated intention to resume executions under the death penalty. Freedom of speech is being persistently curtailed, and human rights defenders and independent journalists are being in intimidated. A new Anti-Defamation Act is being used to attack independent media outlets, some of which have had temporarily to close out of fear for the safety of their employees. This situation is, to be honest, entirely unacceptable. Uh, as to the state of emergency, let's make no bones about it. President Yamin has suspended the basic rights of his citizens because the Supreme Court ruled against him. It is an affront to any sense of democratic principle and the rule of law and a blatant power grab. So it is entirely right that these actions have been internationally condemned. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has described the situation as an all-out assault on democracy. The International Commission of Jurists has said that the Maldivian authorities have not come even close to meeting the very high threshold set by international law 
for the derogation of rights in times of genuine emergency. Those of us who follow media reporting will have seen speculation about how various regional powers might respond, particularly in view of the Maldives' location close to those important shipping lanes that run from Malacca to Hormuz. The UK's position on this is clear. The current situation in the Maldives is a political crisis, but is therefore a crisis that requires a political and a diplomatic solution. To address one of the points raised by my right honourable friend, the Government is aware of reports about a Maldives flagged vessel apparently engaging in ship to ship transfers with a DPRK vessel in defiance of the UN Security Council sanction. We are also aware of the Maldives Government's response that the ship does not belong to the Maldives. Uh, I think it is only fair and right that we conduct further inquiries uh, of what obviously is a potentially serious case before coming to any judgment. But broadly speaking, I have to say to the House, our response on what is happening and the deterioration of the situation over the past three years in the Maldives is and will be robust. The, my right hon. Friend, the Foreign Secretary, made a statement on the 5th of February calling for President Yamin to end the state of emergency peacefully, to restore suspended rights and to, mit, to permit the full, free and proper functioning of government. I shall meet the Maldivian ambassador uh, later this week to seek his explanation of what his government is doing in these areas. Our own ambassador, um, that is uh, James Doris, who is based in our uh, embassy in, in Colombo, Sri Lanka, flew to Mali on the 8th of February to raise our concerns directly with the government of the Maldives and to meet opposition politicians and journalists. Of course. Jim Mr. Deputy, I thank the Minister first of all for all that he does. We are deeply appreciated by everyone in this House, and I mean that very, very sincerely, because we, we all appreciate the influence that he has through his position across the world. However, he will have a chance to, uh, when he meets the Moldavian uh, um, ambassador this week. Could I ask him if he's not already doing so? Would he express the concerns that I have, and, and many in this House have, and was expressed last Thursday in the in the debate in Westminster Hall about the persecution of Christians? Uh, who do not have an opportunity to worship their God in the way that they want. Uh, I shall certainly do so, without uh, uh, applying too much levity to the situation. There is rather a long list of things that I will want to address with him, and I hope it will be a conversation, but I will do my level best to ensure that uh, this issue is raised. The UK is also, of course, leading the international response, uh, understandably. Um, we helped to drive the EU Foreign Affairs Council conclusions on the 26th of February, which called for the state of emergency to be lifted. The Council announced it would consider targeted measures if progress on this matter were not made. I also expect the UK to lead a statement of concern at the Human Rights Council in Geneva at the UN later this week, as we did last June, on behalf of some 30 other countries. Now, on the issue of human rights more broadly, Maldives has been one of the Foreign Office's human rights priority countries for several years. We have regularly raised our concerns about human rights, in particular the threatened reimposition of the death penalty with my Maldivian counterparts, as have my colleagues in government. We have and will continue to fund projects which support efforts by Maldivian civil society to promote human rights, to strengthen democratic institutions and advocate for a greater role for women in public life. So we are deeply concerned by reports of increased radicalisation in the Maldives and we take those reports very seriously. We cooperate with the Government of the Maldives in the global fight against terrorism, as we should responsibly do. However, our view is that an open and pluralistic society will be far better placed to combat those underlying drivers of radicalisation. My right hon. Friend was right to point out that the Maldives' decision to leave the Commonwealth in 2016, uh, an institution that was assisting it in addressing a number of those concerns, remains a cause of deep sadness to us. We hope that in time the Maldives will return to the Commonwealth family by reapplying for membership, but clearly uh, in its current state uh, that cannot be the case. Again, my right honourable friend uh, raised the issue of the safety of British visitors, many of whom of course are in the Maldives uh, as we speak. Um, it is clearly an extremely important consideration for us. There are nearly 100,000 British tourists who visit those islands every year. It has to be said not necessarily in the most built-up area of Mali, but nonetheless they are visitors uh, to the Maldives. Uh, he rightly points out that there are significant numbers of Chinese and German tourists there as well. 
Now, we regularly review the Foreign Office travel advice to ensure that travellers have the latest information. We have updated it twice since the 5th of February, most recently on the 21st of last month, following that extension of the state of emergency. Our current advice states that political unrest has to date largely been confined to the capital island, Malé, or to major population centres. Of course. I am very grateful to give way. I very much suspect the majority of tourists don't go to Mali because Mali is the only atoll in, in the whole of the Maldives which is actually dry. Um, but the whole point is that many of these atolls are many, many miles away from Mali and they would be very difficult to get to in the time of a crisis. Further, those fighters who have gone to Syria and Iraq do come from these remote areas because, as I said, they have been radicalised through the mosques and through, uh, through the internet and through social media. So just because they're not in Mali, which is the centre of unrest, doesn't mean to say there aren't problems elsewhere. No. I think it's a very fair point from my right honourable friend, and uh, please uh, be assured um, we will be asking our embassy and, uh, as I say, James Doris, our ambassador, our excellent ambassador uh, from Colombo, to be keeping uh, the advice that we give uh, under constant review. Um, as I said, although few British tourists visit uh, the major population centres, we do advise those who do that they should ex uh, exercise caution and avoid any protests or rallies. But I will uh, ensure that uh, we give further thought along the lines of, of my right hon. Friend's uh, contribution just now. We have had no indication to date that any British tourists have been affected directly by the unrest or indeed that it has affected the resorts in which they stay or the functioning of Marley's International Airport. The safety of British nationals will always be our primary priority, and we shall continue to keep our travel advice under constant review. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, let me conclude. Uh, the current situation in the Maldives is deeply concerning. Uh, President Yamin's crackdown on media, judges and political opponents through the suspension of fundamental rights is unacceptable in any country that calls itself a democracy. This is an argument that I shall make uh, when I see the Maldivian ambassador tomorrow in the Foreign Office. I know that he works closely with UK parliamentarians to promote his country in a positive light here in the UK. I hope he will have heard many of the concerns that have been raised tonight in this debate, not least because I think they are raised by parliamentarians who have the interests of Maldives and its citizens close to their heart. Colleagues in this House will share my particular concerns at this sustained misuse of parliamentary process uh, in the Maldives, which has been used to justify these measures. The members of the APPG for Maldives, whilst I understand, understandably are keen not to talk down uh, the reputation of the islands, might usefully consider ways in which they could consider speaking against this abuse. We shall continue to work, both bilaterally and with international partners, to urge President Yamin to end the state of emergency peacefully, to restore all articles of the Constitution and to restore the proper functioning of Parliament so that the people of the Maldives can once more enjoy their full democratic rights and freedoms and live without fear or intimidation.